Here we go, right over here. Mr. McCardle has a microphone, too, if you guys would like to use it, it would be easier for people to back. I have a pretty loud voice. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk. Dr. Paul, thank you for your service to our country. Uh, yeah. Four years ago, I was not a Ron Paul fan, and uh, my carpool buddy was a Ron Paul fan. And <laughs> every time, every time I, I uh, grumbled about something and said uh, the state of uh, the union, now, well, you know, Dr. Paul, if we would elect him, we wouldn't be in this mess right now. <laughs> so, so I, I would set out to shut him up, and I got on the internet and was going to show him why you shouldn't be president, and now I'm here. <laughs> kick those Muslims and you know and, and now I see that everything you said is true now we I think I, I think uh, if we can get all the women in the country if you can convince them to look down at their seven or eight year old child or grandchild and ask them if they want those children to fight in Iran in ten years from now because the kids who are fighting and dying in Afghanistan right now were eight years old when we invaded that country so if we can get the mothers of the United States together and decide you're not going to sacrifice your children for a war that it's just for oil, then we can win this thing. Well, thank you, Dr. Thank Paul. you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paul. In Arizona, we happen to be pretty fortunate that our access to natural and our alternative medicine is pretty good nationally speaking, but it just really bothers me, um, my husband's a naturopathic physician, that a lot of people have to go out of the country to get, you know, treatments that are overly regulated here in the United States, and I see the FDA wanting to regulate people's access to, you know, supplements, um, dietary nutritional supplements, and I'm not, I'm not talking about medical marijuana, I'm, I'm talking about nutritional supplements, and I just wonder, when you're president, what do you think the right path would be so Americans can choose, you know, to have the kind of health care they can expect. Uh, she's asking about alternative health care and the restrictions placed uh, uh, on both by states and the federal government. Actually, you have to worry about the United Nations, too, wanting to get involved on uh, uh, regulation of uh, uh, prescription drugs and, and vitamins and nutritional products. Um, the the uh, thing of it is the federal government shouldn't be in the business at all. And, and you know, and I'm probably a little bit bold. She wanted to be cautious about, um, she's talking about nutritional substances, she's not talking about marijuana. But um, if, if you have freedom of choice, you have freedom of choice everywhere. You, you don't try to sort it out. You have freedom of choice to make bad mistakes and make good mistakes. So if you say, well, I want, these byproducts are bad, we're gonna, I'm not, I don't want those, then that gets, it's the, uh, that gives them the permission of the power to do because they might say what well, you're doing and taking because you might want to drink raw milk and raw milk is, is dangerous so they won't, don't want you to drink raw milk so it's the principle and the way I try to describe this is that you know uh, if you believe in freedom of religion which we're all supposed to believe in that means you don't have to have a religion or you can have a religion that none of us agree with and we just let them go as long as they don't hurt and kill people with it that's their spiritual uh, beliefs and, you know, if you can make all your decisions about your spiritual life and your hereafter, and then also that we still, up until recently, like this week, we started burning Qurans. Uh, we're not supposed to be book burners. We're supposed to be able to read and study, study communism and combat bad <laughs> ideas. But all of a sudden, we accept this notion that anything you put in your body, you have to get absolute permission from local government, the federal government, the United Nations. No, you should have absolutely free choice. But the regulation, they said, there's no regulations. They're going to give you stuff. They're going to lie. No, you can't lie. You can't defraud. You can't pretend you have a cure for cancer. And, uh, and, and if you hurt people, if you give them bad products, they have to be responsible. This is a notion that we can depend on the FDA. Uh, <laughs> it's not since the FDA protects the drug companies. <laughs> to enforce any laws. If you're protected in the state of Arizona to uh, buy and, and sell and use nutritional products, uh, I would get rid of all the mandates. I don't want the federal mandates. Some people don't like that because I don't want to get involved in social matters and say, 
oh, that means you're going to allow such and such to occur and you don't want to take define marriage and, and this sort of thing. But uh, the government just should stay out of these things. Yes. The more, the better. And if you get at the local level, most of these things I want the state government to uh, stay out. They should protect our freedoms, freedom of choice, protect people from hurting each other and defrauding each other and uh, slandering people. There are, there are regulations. And a lot of people think that uh, I'm soft on regulations, but we really aren't. Uh, I, the other day I talked a little bit about this, and I said the, the environment is better protected on the private property, and the private property is protected, you'll have good environmental protection. And then they, they, the, the left just didn't, didn't understand this. They said, oh, you mean the corporations can do anything they want because they would be in charge. It's not the case. They, could do, they would be able to do a lot less. When corporations and governments get together, then they gang up on us, whether it's medical, uh, medical care or those medical choices uh, or the way you protect the environment. Uh, if you give the power to the government, the special interests take over. Special interests should be the, pe the people, the individual, individual liberty protected as it is designated under the Constitution. <laughs> My question for you is, if elected president, how easy would it be for us to get out of these global agreements that um, infringe on our national sovereignty, like the UN, NATO? How easy would it be for us to um, just leave it alone? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me answer that, but I'm going to ask you one question first. Where is your home, and where did you come from today? Um, Unionville, New York, on Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'm a senior. That's fantastic. <laughs> well, uh, I, as you know, all the treaties, technically speaking, you get out of treaties by, you know, there's a process of doing it. But a president does have the authority not to be too energetic in enforcing these treaties because you can always, you know, we should not be able to amend the Constitution with a treaty. Some people say that we go to war, beginning with Korea and these other places, because if you sign a treaty, it becomes the law of the land. And therefore, the law of the land says that the UN says go to war, we have to go to war. You can't do that. That's, that's way too much. You can't amend the Constitution. So if it's a, a treaty or a Constitution that says it contradicts our Constitution, then you don't have to do it. And uh, I, I, if they say... Uh, that you have to go to war under UN resolution, I would say, no, I don't. I don't have to. I'm commander in chief. Not only constitutionally is it it's a very questionable and it's wrong to do it, but morally it's wrong. What what if this would be true that you could have a legal document where you signed a a, a, a resolution that you would come to the aid of the uh, of uh, Taiwan, no matter what, and immediately an attack on Taiwan meant we had to draft people and send them over and have a war over there. But if that treaty was signed 50 or 60 years ago, one or two generations, by what right does a previous generation have to commit this generation to an automatic war? And in a way, your concerns are justified because that's about the way it is. There's a lot of places, whether it's Taiwan or other places in the Middle East, it is assumed that under certain conditions attack, that we will automatically be there. And we're almost there, too, because, you know, we're automatically in, in Libya and Egypt and Syria and Iraq and all these places, and not, not legally. So that, that is a real challenge. You can get out of it. But you get out of it when you have a constitutional president, you get support from the Congress, but you really still have to have support from the people. We have time for one more. How about the gentleman back there? Well, no, now I'll have to do two. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. I just had a question. Um, can we get back to the gold standard, and what would the process be? Okay, uh, not only can we, we will have to. All, when paper money is destructed, which they've done that many, many times, gold has never destructed. Uh, governments abuse it and, uh, and, and eliminate it. But um, uh, as Zolik, the current and retiring president of the World Bank, knows what's going on, and they know what's happening. They're talking about international currency. 
But he had the audacity the other day to say, and when we do, we'll have to incorporate gold. Gold gives, you know, reassurance that it uh, that that they won't print money, or at least that's supposed to be the purpose. So uh, yeah, to get confidence back in, you have to have something of real value. So gold will come back. Now you can wait until a total disaster, and if we continue to do what we're doing, that's going to happen. You might end up with a. Uh, a primitive economy where you're using gold coins and silver coins, but if you do what I'm suggesting, cut the spending and get back to balance, you could work your way out of it. We did it after the Civil War. Conditions were much different after the Civil War because we weren't uh, involved around the world. We didn't have a, a welfare state, and we quit spending money, and they withdrew greenbacks, and uh, we went off in 61, had a restoration after 1875, it was a three-year period where they went and graduated through the transition. And by 1878, it was a non-event. And they took gold from $200 an ounce, essentially took it down to $20 an ounce. They went back on the gold standard and ushered in a very, very productive age until the Federal Reserve came, came in. So you could do that. Uh, England, uh, the British went back on gold in the 1920s after World War I. But uh, take, for instance, if the market price your a dollar at two hundred dollars an ounce, and you went back at twenty dollars and didn't shrink the money supply, it wouldn't work. The British went back the wrong way. They tried to go back, and that is very deflationary and failed. So they said, "Oh, see, gold doesn't work." But no, there's there's ways to do it. But if nothing happens, if it totally out of control, gold comes back automatic because that's how gold came, became money. It was automatic. It came about in the marketplace that people know it, understand it, and trust it. And that is why, you know, when total conditions fell, uh, fall apart like it did in Vietnam, you know, at, as that war ended, the people who tried to escape the, uh, the paper currency of Vietnam was worthless. If you had to bribe your way out, guess how you got out? With gold coins, because that's the real money. Now, if you had a real quick question there, I'll try and answer it. Did you have one more? Quick second. Um, while we're on the subject of gold and silver, I own the company Republic Monetary Exchange here in Phoenix, and we're in the gold and silver business, and I'm afraid you get elected, I'm going to lose my business. <laughs> but I will say it will be worth it to have good government. In the meantime, uh, I am so passionate about your campaign, Dr. Paul, and I'm about halfway there to the maximum. So what I would like to do, if it's all right with you, is lay down the challenge. Leaving this room today, it's going to probably cost in the thousands of dollars for breakfast, I am willing to put up uh, $2,500 towards the breakfast, asking others to match that so that you can leave here with all of the amount of money that was collected and not have any cost to the breakfast, if that's okay with you. That sounds like a pretty good deal. Right? Yeah. <laughs>